Welcome to the CyberSec and AI podcast. Today, we're speaking to Michal Pehocek, the CTO of Avast. He leads the core technology and research and development teams here, and he's responsible for the fields of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and cybersecurity. And this is exactly what we speak about in this conversation, AI and cybersecurity now, and what it will mean in the future. We're sharing the most captivating parts of our conversation. Let's dig in. You're listening to the CyberSec and AI podcast. Michal, in the context of security, can you give an example of a human error that can make a system vulnerable? Like phishing attacks. Okay. So the, yeah. world, also, you know, the world is full of phishing attacks uh, where people receive a deceiving emails asking them to provide social security number and credit card details or click uh, to the link, you know, kind of making people mm-hmm. really to do stuff that in the end, uh, you know, in the end uh, helps the attacker to get access to private data or is making the user mm-hmm, to kind mm-hmm. of install a piece of software uh, that is uh, infecting uh, the hardware that the person is using, which otherwise would be more difficult, actually right, close to right. impossible. Yeah, yeah so um, which... This kind of brings me to my, my next question, and that is sort of the, well, there's the human factor on the side of, of the actual people making the, the errors and, and uh, creating vulnerabilities in the system. And then there's the side of people who are sort of protecting us. And, and, and for me, it's kind of curious, uh, can AI be sort of a permanent solution to it, or will you always need uh, people sort of watching over our, our safety and security online? Is there always kind of a human factor in this, or can it all fully be automated? So, uh, because a cybersecurity is going to be an AI against AI race, Mm. it will always include people in the loop, right? Right. So, because, you know, these days the attackers use heavily software, AI-based automation, machine learning, artificial intelligence to be able to craft sophisticated malware and to be able to deploy the malware Mm -hmm. at scale, at speed, very, you know, in a very flexible manner. And uh, us, as defenders, we need to be super focused to try to understand that we better not waste human talent mm-hmm. on fighting with AI-based attacks. So that's okay. why we are building complex, sophisticated AI that is here to be able to defend the society against algorithms and AI-based attacks. Mm-hmm. Having said so, you know, once... Once the attackers launch the AI-based campaign, they'll still continue to employ their brains into trying mm. to figure out what is next, what's the next most exciting or most dangerous way of attacking. Mm-hmm, and that mm-hmm. will always come from people. Yeah. Which is why we as defenders need to deploy AI so that we are saving the defenders' brains to be able to do the same thing. So, mm-hmm. so long term, I really see that you no know, attackers' brains will be fighting with the defenders' brains, and we need those brains to be fresh, available, well educated, very well trained, and excited to defend. If okay. I if I would make those brains busy mm-hmm. fighting autonomous attacks, fighting AI, we will never catch up, and we will be losing mm-hmm, mm-hmm. this this war. So, for, right. through, through this argument. Um, I'm explaining that there always will be people in the game mm-hmm. in cybersecurity, and there needs to be. You're listening to the CyberSec and AI podcast. Right, right. And I guess what I'm also hearing is that you're saying it also doesn't all come down to just the technology. There's an educational piece to this entire problem, correct? Definitely. And there are, kind of, again, two educational dimensions. One is we need a super educated, well-experienced uh, defenders, people mm-hmm. who are working not only with in cybersecurity firms, but also in, in businesses, industries, governments, government, yeah. and kind of helping people to be safe. At the same time, we need to raise the bar of education of ordinary citizens mm-hmm. to understand that you know, they also need to participate in, in cybersecurity by understanding what is it that they do, by trying to understand implications of actions mm-hmm, that they mm-hmm. trigger online. It also requires education. And you know, if you talk to 50 people you know, you would learn that part of those people don't really know what's going on online with their private data, with their passwords, uh, with their emails. Mm -hmm. So we also need education in the direction. Yeah. So the conclusion is basically is that it's not 
getting easier for people, for professionals working in the security space. It's getting much harder. You shared a number of data points uh, and, and maybe if you could just point to a couple of like key challenges from uh, someone working as a CTO that you're really facing at the moment, uh, uh, technically in this field, what, what do we have to overcome to really move a couple of steps ahead at the moment? So uh, there is a, a number of uh, technological challenges that each of the CTO and cybersecurity is mm -hmm. worried about, starting from kind of building the proper pipelines that are robust, reliable, towards uh, building good quality algorithms that are targeted towards uh, specific old and new attack vectors, mm -hmm. and to kind of be able to to run the operation of defense so that it's it's robust and it delivers uh, to customers' promise. Mm -hmm. uh, in my in my group, in my CTO org, uh, we are trying to kind of be slightly more forward looking, and we try to kind of figure out how can we get free, how can we jailbreak from this vicious cycle of kind of fixing the algorithms as a response mm -hmm. to a new uh, attack or threat. We are, we are trying to think: what well, is there something more general that can provide us with a, with a leap? so that we can get ahead of the attackers, right. not knowing what's coming next. And we are, we, are, we are working with AI scientists and computer science researchers and trying to understand how the concept of, uh, I would say, industry general artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. therefore AI algorithms that are still pretty vertical, useful in cybersecurity, mm -hmm. but more general, so that the one class of algorithms can be used across the domain. Right. So, so that not for each new attack vector, we just get teams together and build scrum teams and build a new capability and train new algorithms. No, we would like to have like one more general uh, AI capability that we can then train automatically based on the data that we have from the internet mm -hmm. to be able to sustain uh, wider space of uh, future attacks, not knowing what is coming mm -hmm. next. Mm -hmm. So we spend time and we invest in building more general artificial intelligence mm -hmm. that can be used in cybersecurity. Similarly to what people do in text, what people do in speech, what is done in uh, health healthcare these days. Yeah, kind of yeah. DeepMind came up with uh, alpha faults, mm -hmm. this this algorithm set of algorithms that is capable mm -hmm. of of uh, solving the folding the protein folding problem. So we have kind of a similar way of thinking about a AI cybersecurity uh, as, as well. Mm -hmm. And so security has been sort of a challenge for for. Um and many years now, but uh, more and more we're hearing also about privacy being the, the key concern and, and for us too. And um, how tough is it for you being at the, the frontier of this? Because really on the other side, what you have is, is huge tech companies with huge budgets and very advanced AI algorithms doing whatever they can to, to track people and, and do collect more, more data. So there been, there've been some wins in, in this regard, uh, but uh, as a professional working in the space, how do you see this, this situation? It is actually super exciting because people usually see privacy and security as two separate problems, mm -hmm. uh, two separate challenges. And in my understanding, they are really near, mm -hmm. close one to the other. And the reason why it's so is that through the race of AI that is building highly specific human-centric attacks, mm -hmm. we are using algorithms that are being trained on private data. Mm -hmm. Private data that uh, attackers steal, as, as it happened yeah. in the past, they steal private data in big volumes or people willingly provide, okay? And often users of the internet in exchange for great convenience, right. they provide private data to, to big companies, to big tech, but also to small companies and to some good actors and bad, mm -hmm. bad actors, mm -hmm. so the world of those who are making harm, those who are making profit, those who are changing people's mind, mm -hmm. it's kind of morphing, right? So yeah. it is through privacy and cybersecurity, we are kind of seeing this new space of danger on the internet, which is a combination of all these. And um, us as a cybersecurity professionals, we feel passionate about users' privacy, and we are investing money and our creativity to come up with tools that 
protect people from privacy leaks. The truth to be said is that ordinary users are not so excited about privacy. Privacy right. is not such a value for an ordinary shopper as it for me, so I'm a security professional, right? So it, it's, it's, been, it's become of an effort to explain to people that they should be careful about the privacy. And um, yeah, that's, that's the place where a cybersecurity and privacy meets because of users' private data being a mechanism that allows mm -hmm. to train uh, super efficient cybersecurity attacks. Yeah, yeah. And so if you look at maybe the, the end of the decade, uh, 2030, what kind of, what are we going to be protecting ourselves from uh, by then? What kind of technology and, and measures will we need in, in your view? So I really believe that you know, we are in the business of mind protection. Mm -hmm. So we'll be protecting, protecting people's mind. Mm -hmm. And our, our duty as cybersecurity professionals will be to make sure that people are not uh, triggering actions with unintended consequences. So that people don't do things that they don't want to do. And uh, the, the big part of internet will kind of continue making us to do things that we actually don't want to do, but we do because, because we want to do at the moment, right? Either because of lack of knowledge, lack mm -hmm. of transparency, uh, short, short term attention mm -hmm. versus a long term intention. Mm -hmm. So we kind of need to help people to really understand what's going on so that they can be, you know, I would say, Cybersecurity companies in the future, in 20 years from now, will be working hard for getting people out of matrix. Because we have yeah. users in the matrix, right? So people are really going to log into their social networks and that are a victim of the attention-based economy where the attention is being monetized. And I think that in, in 20 years from now, we'll be protecting people against malicious actors, attackers who are doing immediate harm to people by stealing their private data or uh, uh, deploying ransomware attacks on their devices. Mm -hmm. At the same time as those who are manipulating us users of the internet right. to execute things with unintended consequences. Uh, this may sound way too cosmic, but it's not because a phishing attack is an instance right. of this action that you trigger because you don't have proper knowledge whether this particular link is legitimate or is a fraud, right? So, but making people to do click is one thing. And you, we in Avas, we do a pretty good job in being able to detect phishing attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, we are scoring in tests uh, like really, really well. Uh, and we know a drill, so we, we mm -hmm. will continue to improve. But to be able to help people to understand news that they read, whether a news that they bump into is telling them that there is this new great great a crypto investment opportunity and it will yield huge returns and they should invest their pension sa savings there, it's much more difficult. Yeah. But it, this can be again the instance of an action that somebody will make a huge profit on because it's outright lie and uh, they will never give the user back their money or whether it is a legitimate opportunity, right? So it's, an, it's, it's another example yeah. of, kind of attacking people's mind for somebody's profit that would cause me harm. And there is the other kind of, I would say, phishing 3.0, where mm -hmm. which is happening today, where we are kind of being fed with lots of truth information that in the end is making us to change our opinions and minds and create fear, create anger, divide the society so that we cast vote mm. in a way that right. is causing unintended, yeah. unintended, unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. And it's much more difficult than kind of being able to use AI that detects like a like deep fake video that has been doctored, right? So we can do this, right? It's in a way it's again AI against AI who's got better algorithm deceiving or detecting, right? right? But uh, being able to help people to navigate in this space of truthful information that each particle one you can classify as a lie, but still being a good companion, good, good guardian of their internet mm -hmm. freedom is a non-trivial uh, problem. 
yeah. for which I don't have an answer myself. But if you ask me, what is it that people will be working on in 10 years from now? This is it. You're listening to the CyberSec and AI podcast. So which, uh, which projects excite you when you look into the future? Who else is uh, protecting uh, people's uh, minds? Uh, I think our audience would appreciate if maybe you can point them to a couple of, of uh, AI-related projects they could follow as well on their own to, to know the field a little bit better. Um, so there is a lot of research going on currently in uh, the field of uh, AI and manipulation. Mm-hmm. So there are research groups that are investigating the use of AI to be able to detect deep fakes and mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. changed content. We have great collaboration with UC Berkeley, with mm-hmm. Professor yeah. Hani Farid, who is one of the leading experts on internet manipulation. He speaks often uh, to US Senate and provides uh, explanations to what is going on currently on the internet. So this this definitely is a exciting uh, way of doing research uh, for us. Kind of being able to uh, detect uh, information which uh, is coming from uh, sites that uh, have not been always uh, non manipulative. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's an exciting machine learning problem. We collaborate with universities and we are trying to figure out what AI can be used for such a detection. And we are learning an interesting uh, lesson here, which is uh, detecting a doctored content or manipulating text is an easier problem comparing to presentation. Mm-hmm. To be able to pr- present our findings in, in a way that is uh, inclusive, transparent, engaging, and makes people to follow further leads and further references is a non-trivial exercise. People right. people are not so focused on reading the news mm-hmm. with a bunch of ref- references around the text. So right. we also work with uh, researchers at the University of Atlanta, at, uh, at Georgia Tech, uh, University, Technical University in Atlanta, and uh, we we work with them on a UX design mm-hmm. uh, problems that help us to understand what is the best possible possible way how to how to present this information to to our users. So that's that's exciting. Yeah, that's perfect. So we will include uh, links to these projects in the in the show notes for the audience and. Uh, is there maybe something to to add before uh, finishing? You know, and otherwise we are really looking forward to, um, you know, being with you at uh, CyberSec and AI. But uh, definitely, like that, yeah. uh, there's maybe one thought I'd like to share, which is, you know, come back to the concept of private data, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. I, I'm a big believer that users have rights to their private data. And by by private data, I don't mean information about my uh, insurance and uh, my biometrics Mm -hmm. information, but the models of my bias and models of my behavior online that the big companies are building, right? So Mm -hmm. whenever I enter a shop, the shop knows about me quite a bit. And the shop gives me recommendations. I like to learn what they know about me, how they think about right. me, what, what do they think I will do, what do they think I like. And this is kind of an aggregated form of private data that the company was able to construct based on my past behavior. Mm-hmm. I like to understand. I like to own this. Yeah, It's part of me. It's part of me on the internet. It's part of me that uh, the big companies are storing about myself. And the fact that it's not... My ownership, is their ownership, represents a loss of my digital freedom. Yeah. I'm less free because I'm manipulated. I don't know how. I give an example. People are often, people often end up in the echo chambers in social network based on what they like, what they post, what they share, where they've been, mm-hmm. what are their Google searches. This all constitutes piece of data that assigns me to an echo chamber. And because of of this membership, I'm seeing other content that is a function Mm -hmm. of the echo chamber. And I may, I like to understand how the echo chamber looks like, how it's constructed, who is, who is in there? Why am I in this echo chamber? Maybe I learned that there's something that the algorithms think about me 
but they're not true. Right. I'd like to help them to debug. I'd like to be where I want to be in the echo chamber that I really want to be. I'd like to I like the internet to treat me the way how I really want and not necessarily how the attention economy field algorithms mm-hmm. want mm-hmm. me to, right? So I actually think that, that we are in the unique situation where technology firms like cybersecurity companies can be huge players in the attention-based economy because they can be here truly for the you know, in the business of protecting people interests against those who uh, recommend the content to us, recommend goods, recommend text, media, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and help give the users the tools that provides with more, them with more visibility and with their rights to their mm-hmm. true digital digital rights. Right, and, and is it? Uh, I- Are you sort of leaning in more into the technology as opposed to governments uh, playing the the big part of the role here? So I'm a technologist. I don't understand the governments besides of uh, casting my vote regularly. But governments are trying to regulate AI. Mm -hmm. They are trying to regulate big tech. Uh, We see a lot going on. I actually think that, you know, if the society understands better what the technology can do, then the regulation would be better targeted, would be mm-hmm. better quality, mm-hmm. can be more in the role of defending true people interests. But because the governments and the public sector and the regulators are not, actually, they do not have the evidence of, of what is possible, mm-hmm. what the uh, cybersecurity firms of the future can do in the future, then the regulation is right. imperfect. Right. So there is some respect. The truth is, you know, in the future, I I, I believe there's going to be uh, opportunity for the governments to contribute and to be also uh, in the shoes of defending people' interest online. Appreciate your forward-thinking thoughts, uh, Michal. Uh, thank you so much for for participating, and we'll see you at uh, CyberSec and AI this year. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Have you registered for the CyberSec and AI conference this year, happening November 4th and 5th? If you haven't done so, the link is in the description. 